Welcome to the changing global order in a post-pandemic world. The International Republican Institute's discussion forum on the virtual sidelines of this year's Republican National Convention. Thank you to our partners, Microsoft and the European Union delegation to the United States for joining forces to produce the important discussions you're about to see. The unity of the West will be essential to sustaining the free and open world that is the surest source of our security and prosperity. And the EU-US partnership will be vital to that end. A central arena in the struggle between freedom and tyranny will be the digital domain. And companies like Microsoft will be instrumental to ensuring that technology supports the values of open societies and not new forms of surveillance authoritarianism. Uh, IRI is a nonprofit, nonpartisan American NGO whose mission is to strengthen democracy around the world. We do that by building the capacity of political parties, civil society, and everyday people to participate in the political process and by helping to create the conditions for democracy where it does not yet exist. Over the past several months, we've seen firsthand how the COVID-19 pandemic has strained not only health and economic systems, but political systems. It has canceled elections, toppled governance, stressed democracies, and emboldened authoritarians. At the same time, it's created new opportunities for tremendous and exciting growth and innovation. It's also reinforced the importance and the strength and solidarity across the family of liberal democracies. In the next couple of hours, we'll hear several discussions about what a post-COVID world might mean for technology, trade, democracy, the digital economy, the transatlantic relationship, and the future of the world order. We'll pose the question, what must business leaders and policymakers do to ensure that democracy and open market economies prevail in the 21st century? You'll hear compelling answers from some of the world's foremost business leaders and policymakers, including uh, the IRI board, Senator Kelly Ayotte, and IRI's chairman, Senator Dan Sullivan. Before we start, I want to turn to our friend, Ambassador Stavros Lambernidis, Ambassador of the European Union to the United States, to say a brief word of welcome. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, it is my uh, special honor to join uh, IRI President Dan Twining in welcoming our viewers on both sides of the Atlantic to this virtual event. Uh, in the context of the 2020 Republican National Convention. Uh, today's event is organized uh, with the cooperation of the International Republican Institute, as you just heard, and Microsoft Corporation. So special thanks uh, to uh, uh, President Twining, to IRI Chair Senator Dan Sullivan, and to Microsoft uh, President Brad Smith for co-hosting this uh, with us, the European Union delegation of the United States. Uh, I'm also delighted that we have uh, joining us today uh, such prominent uh, leaders uh, from uh, Europe, uh, including the uh, Commissioner for Trade, um, uh, Phil Hogan, and the first Vice President uh, of the European uh, Parliament, uh, Merit uh, McGuinness. Now, uh, dear friends, political conventions are uh, famously domestic affairs, so you might wonder what, uh, what was uh, Dan and I thinking uh, when we suggested that we could attract attention uh, for a major virtual transatlantic event. Uh, well, uh, a virtual setting reminds us uh, that COVID-19 continues to present unprecedented challenges that no one, no matter how big, uh, can effectively tackle alone. Uh, so this is, in my view at least, the perfect time uh, to remind ourselves that we are not in this alone. Friends stand by each other, especially during crises. And as we stare uh, the post-COVID world in the eye, we must remember that throughout history, we have always been stronger together. We are stronger because the transatlantic economy has grown and prospered, uh, as our first panel will discuss, with a focus on our shared digital futures. Our trade and mutual investment provides a secure future for millions of our citizens on both sides of the Atlantic. And as our second panel will address, um, we are stronger and more secure when the EU and the US work toward the same goals regionally and internationally, uh, fighting COVID, uh, reversing climate change while creating sustainable growth and millions of new jobs, promoting open, free, rules-based uh, and uh, fair trade, uh, pursuing non-proliferation, addressing disinformation and authoritarian narratives. Uh, all these are global challenges requiring global solutions uh, through the building of global coalitions. So our shared values and support for democracy, the market economy, and fundamental human rights must be a North Star in defending the liberal global order. 
These are no longer niceties, no longer romantic notions. If we do not provide the global leadership to protect and promote these shared values, others will be only too happy to try to fill the void. Uh, this does not mean, of course, that the EU and the US will agree on everything. Um, our disagreements, <laughs> we all know this, can dominate the uh, news cycles and uh, sometimes made to appear insurmountable. Uh, this is simply not true. Um, and we know we may discuss a few of them today, uh, but we must always remember that our wider shared values and interests, our futures, our histories, and our destinies are intertwined, and that it is only by working together that we can preserve what we have worked so hard to build. So I look forward to speaking with you later in the program. And now uh, I return the floor to my uh, fr good friend, uh, Dan Twain. Thanks, Ambassador. So nice to see you. So nice to be here with you and your team. Uh, thank you uh, all uh, for joining this important discussion, which I'm personally very much looking forward to. Uh, I'm now pleased to introduce Nancy McLernan, President and CEO of the Global Business Alliance, to kick off our first discussion called Shared Digital Futures in the Post-COVID Era. Nancy. <laughs> Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Ambassador, for opening remarks, and welcome everyone to the first panel for today's event for a discussion on shared digital futures in a post-COVID era. I'm really pleased to be here this morning. First, a little bit about uh, the Global Business Alliance. We are a trade association based in Washington, D.C., representing about 200 international companies doing business in the United States. Companies like Nestle and Siemens and uh, Samsung and Toyota. So we represent companies from all different industries that are here in the United States. And we really are the voice of foreign direct investment in America. I'm really pleased to be here um, this morning. Um, and as an organization, GBA advocates for policies that help the American economy, communities, and workers um, reap the greatest possible benefits from global commerce. Today's discussion is, of course, of critical importance to all of commerce. Most companies today are technology companies. Some of them just make a physical product. Um, as we move from the COVID emergency response phase into recovery and rebuilding, we are already seeing an acceleration in the digitization of the economy. By Microsoft's own estimate, the global workforce will absorb nearly 149 million new tech-oriented jobs over the next five years. So for this morning's discussion, I'd like to structure uh, into three different areas. One is on the potential technology can offer us. Uh, the second, we'll discuss the challenges in achieving that potential. And finally, we'll talk about ways in which policymakers and the private sector can work together to overcome those challenges. I want to invite the viewers uh, to engage with our panel today uh, by submitting a question. You can do so either through one of the Q&A buttons on the agenda of our custom streaming platform or in the comments section of your YouTube screen. We'll select from the questions and ask our panelists to weigh in toward the end of the discussion. So now I'd like to welcome our uh, terrific panel. Uh, we have with us former U.S. Senator Kelly Ayotte, Brad Smith, President of Microsoft, and European Commissioner for Trade, Phil Hogan, who I don't see. Is he on with us? Okay, uh, I will just uh, move on. I'm not seeing the commissioner. Uh, is anyone else seeing him? No. Okay. No. All right. Why don't I first, uh, why don't I go ahead and, and, and start up? Uh, okay, great. 
Um, so I'm going to ask um, uh, both the senator and Brad uh, a question for both of you to consider. So beyond the critical dependence uh, the economy has had on technology during the pandemic, digitization of the economy has become central to just about all industries, as I mentioned earlier, including the manufacturing sector. So um, I'd like each of you to offer your perspective on this trend and how it could shape our competitiveness, our national security um, going forward. And Brad, why don't we go ahead and begin with you? Uh, well, first, thank you for having me. I, a huge thank you to the IRI for uh, having uh, this event. And it's always an honor to be with Kelly Ayotte to do anything. And I look forward to uh, seeing Phil Hogan as well. Um, yeah, I think what I'd start with is we just ended a decade where digital technology continually accelerated uh, and really transformed the economy around the world and certainly uh, among the democracies of the world. Uh, and then came 2020, and yeah, we are facing a pandemic that none of us expected to be addressing this year. Uh, and interestingly enough, it accelerated digitization even more. Uh, what we quickly found was basically about two years of digitization taking place in the course of two months as everybody was forced to work virtually. Uh, and I think we should expect this faster rate of digitization to continue throughout the decade ahead. Um, well, what does that mean? Well, it does first, I think, mean that there is a lot of opportunity especially for the countries, for the economies, the industries and the companies that really make the most of it. Uh, I think your reference to manufacturing frames that well. Um, if I think about middle America, Wisconsin, where I grew up, or I'll say the middle of Europe, Germany, you really have two great manufacturing centers and we're seeing the manufacturing floor digitized. But more than that, we're seeing the reach of manufacturing and the business opportunities for manufacturers really continue to grow quite substantially. Because for a century, the role of a manufacturer was largely to produce something, ship it, and maybe service it afterwards. But now there's an ongoing opportunity for a manufacturer to be really an integral part of every customer that it supports with the constant flow of data. Data that is not only improving, say, the maintenance of the equipment that manufacturers build, but the use of that equipment to deliver services to follow on customers. So there's a huge opportunity, I think, with better access and more data, with more use of digital technology, uh, to really create an ongoing driver uh, for economic growth on mm -hmm. both sides of the Atlantic and in the other market economies around the world. Now, there are challenges as well, and I know we'll get at those, but it perhaps starts with the need to skill a new generation of workers so that they can make the most of this new digital technology. I think a need that will be felt not just by governments and educators, but by employers as well, where we're, we'll be making ongoing investments in employee learning. Great, thank you. Uh, Senator, why don't we go to you next? Uh, yes, thank you, Nancy. I'm, I'm very honored to be here uh, with Brad and uh, look, looking forward to seeing Commissioner Hogan. And I want to thank IRI as well in the European Union. But I just wanted to jump off what Brad said. I mean, we have seen with COVID that what, what we saw was already a trend, that technology is ubiquitous. It impacts everything. Uh, and it also impacts the access that people have. Um, and I think that's been apparent as, as the mother of uh, two children uh, during this COVID crisis, you know, how it impacts education, uh, where we can invest, uh, how we can get better, not only with our education system, but with our digital skills, that's going to impact our competitiveness. But uh, just to, to hop off uh, Brad's example on manufacturing, when I say that technology is ubiquitous, I serve on the board of Caterpillar, for example. And you know we're investing in automation. Uh, now it's not just that you uh, you know you build a mining vehicle, but what data can you get from uh, the the mining site or the construction site to make sure that you can improve worker safety, uh, that you can give uh, you know the person running the site more information to be more efficient and better serve uh, their customers. So this is going to continue and making sure 
that we have uh, the skills that we need and the access. I mean, one thing that's become apparent uh, through all of this, especially with COVID, is, for example, broadband access, something Microsoft has worked tremendously on. Uh, but, but that has to be a basic right that everyone has. And it's become more clear that as we go forward, we really have to invest in these issues. Okay, thank you. Um, Senator, um, given your previous public service as a senior member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, how would you characterize the continued cooperation between the U.S. and our allies in Europe and, and, uh, and elsewhere um, from a strategic standpoint? And given today's focus on the digitized future, how important will that cooperation be in the years to come? Well, I, I mean, I think our allies are one of our most important strategic assets that we have uh, as a nation. And it's really foundational to our national security. If you look at our national defense strategy, um, it emphasizes that we need to strengthen our alliances. And that's very important, our transatlantic alliance, our alliance with uh, NATO and our NATO partners as well as uh, other partnerships that we can, we can make, uh, for example, in the Middle East, uh, as we address important issues going forward and in Asia. So I think that that is foundational uh, to who we are. And if you look at the impact of technology, this only becomes more important because we're at an inflection point where we need standards uh, that are universal. Uh, when we're thinking about the development of technology and how it impacts people's lives. And in order to do that, we need to cooperate with our allies to come up. <clears throat> Excuse me. To we'll, give you, uh, we'll give you a little, little break. I couldn't agree more with some of the things that you were saying. And, and Dan said earlier in the introduction about now is the time to strengthen our global connections with our allies uh, all around the world, uh, not weaken them. Um, so, Brad, from your vantage point, how has the pandemic accentuated uh, the interconnectedness of our economy? And can you talk about, has anything surprised you in terms of how organizations and individuals have utilized technology in response to the pandemic? Well, let, let me start with the latter part first. Um, you know, if you just think about the lives we've all led, uh, we have always sort of started every morning, I think, looking for one piece of data. What was the weather forecast and what's the temperature going to be today? And it tells you, you know, what to wear when you leave your home. Uh, but then think about the year 2020 and the role that governments have been playing literally in deciding where whether we can leave our home. Uh, where we can go, can we go to a restaurant, can we go work in the office, and then consider how all of that is being driven by data. Data that, frankly, none of us were generally familiar with a year ago. Um, you know, what is the uh, rate of the spread of this disease? Uh, what is the percentage of people who are testing positive? Uh, what is the capacity of ICU beds in hospitals? What is the availability of PPE? All of this is frankly grounded in data. Uh, and you know, what I have actually found the most surprising really is the enormous variation in whether governments around the world were well prepared to manage their assets in a systemic way using this kind of data. And in many ways, the places that were better prepared or less well prepared, I think might have surprised us. They certainly surprised me. You know, here I live in the Seattle area. You know, it's literally in the shadow of Microsoft and Amazon, two of the biggest tech companies in the world. But there was no systemic access to data about the collective ICU hospital bed capacity of the hospitals in our region. We just didn't manage ICU beds in a systemic way. And as a result, we didn't have data that enabled the public officials in the region to even know when March arrived, whether beds were full or available. Now I contrast that with a meeting with the prime minister of Greece, a virtual meeting, when he pointed to his laptop and said he had a dashboard that it provided a daily update on ICU bed capacity for the entire health service for the country of Greece, which has a 
population well in excess of what we have here in Washington State in the U.S. What it fundamentally shows, I think, is that in so many ways, a modern economy, whether we're talking about the public sector or the private sector or nonprofits, NGOs, really can benefit from, even need, better data to manage what they do in a more systemic way. And I think that's one of the real insights to come out of 2020. And I think what we'll find is then, an, I hope, more of an opportunity for people around the world to think about global issues, whether they relate to carbon or to a virus that spreads around the world, so that we can better measure things in a way that enables us to work more collaboratively across borders. Thank you, Brad. And Commissioner Hogan, welcome. Uh, glad that we got the, the technology um, figured out. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, throw a question over your way. Um, the European Union has long been a vital partner to the U.S. and will continue to play a strategic role as we move forward. Can you talk a little bit about how the digital economy is driving deeper connections across the Atlantic? convention and uh, sharing my fellow panelists uh, on this very important occasion. Uh, you're quite right in listening to Brad talking about the impact of COVID-19 and the huge changes in uh, personal uh, behavior and company behavior from the digitalization of society and economic activity generally. And uh, you're quite right that we are very good partners in the United States. I hope that the United States can, uh, you know, can do better to be good partners of the European Union. I say that, uh, I say that, I suppose, a little bit tongue-in-cheek because we have recently concluded uh, a tariff reduction deal. It wasn't a very big one, but I hopefully it's the beginning of many more deals that we can do together. Uh, Ambassador Lighthizer and I have worked very hard since I, I, got, I got this job on the 1st of December 2019 to try and refresh the relationship and understand the problems on each side and try and find solutions. And I have tried to work with them in terms of what we have to do to improve the interconnectivity between the European Union and the United States to help our economic recovery uh, more quickly. And I believe, of course, that we should be reducing tariffs uh, in order to speed up growth and consumer uh, behavior, but also to keep our supply chains intact uh, and uh, make progress on plurilateral agreements, make progress on standards, make progress on the WTO reform, which is, of course, the global referee for all of the, the trade agreements around the world. So uh, I, w I look forward to uh, certainly seeing the European Union and the United States on many of these important issues coming closer together. Uh, and I think that we have not exactly uh, you know, done what we need to do in that respect, uh, maybe up to recently. But uh, I, I do appreciate the, the, the uh, very strong collaboration now and uh, that I have developed with Ambassador Lighthouse and his team. And uh, this culminated in a couple of very positive and constructive decisions in the last couple of weeks. And uh, I am very anxious to continue that collaboration uh, with him. And uh, hopefully uh, your, your Republican delegates uh, will appreciate that trade between the two biggest uh, global blocks in the world is very important. We, we trade $3 trillion a day, uh, or three, sorry, $3 billion a day. Uh, and uh, this is huge business. Uh, and uh, we shouldn't be looking at who's doing well here, who's doing well there. We should be looking about how we can continue to have this very strong relationship. And it's up to the best horse to jump the ditch, as we say, uh, uh, in my native country of Ireland. So it's a pleasure to be with you. We, I want to continue to deepen the relationship with the United States on trade and to work to reform the trading relationship around the world with our partners and to develop the standards and regulatory cooperation together uh, in line with what Brad has said uh, in the digital area, in the technology area. And I think a trade and technology council between the United States and Europe would be a good structural vehicle uh, in order to achieve that and where we could agree an agenda of work that we could do together. Because if we don't create the standards, somebody else will, and then we might be too late. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so let's talk a little bit now about some of the challenges to achieve the potential that technology offers. 
Um, I'm going to actually go back to you, Commissioner Hogan. And in some ways, the pandemic, and, and you touched on this a little bit, has brought into stark relief the parochial propensities of policymakers across the globe, whether it be digital services, taxes, trade, uh, tariffs, uh, or data privacy policy issues. We've all witnessed unilateral policy actions by nations against their historic allies. And, um, you know, I'd like to get your views on how the pandemic might result in a long-term revaluation of the role and scope of multilateral institutions that we've relied on uh, for so long. What does the future of multilateral cooperation look like from your perspective? And it's a very broad question, but in, on a personal basis, people are, who are working at home are working in their, in their offices. There's now a growing uh, awareness of the importance of the digital economy and the, the role that the digital companies can play in the day-to-day -day lives of business and indeed personal and consumer behavior. And I suppose we have come in the last six months uh, in a direction of achieving a lot more than expected in the digitalization agenda in terms of people's embracing of these technologies than would be probably expected over a three-year period. So how do you actually then uh, harvest this potential uh, to the benefit of economies and societies? And we have to have rules around it as well. Uh, and what we are embracing at the moment is the digital uh, e-commerce discussions in the World Trade Organization so that we have a level playing field, as it were, among, among, and a harmonized set of rules and standards around the world. We have this controversy with the Chinese in relation to forced technology transfer, of course, and how are we? But these are all issues, again, that are feeding into the agenda about how we can create the level playing field. Uh, I think we have to have a global solution to these issues. Then we have the ambitious agenda around not just 5G, but AI, which have huge growth potential. But one fundamental important issue for the people of Europe is that they must be able to trust the technology and trust the digital technologies and trust the benefits that they can get from it. So policy, must keep up with the fast pace of developments in the sector. For example, in artificial intelligence, if properly developed and, uh, and deployed, our AI technologies can work miracles. Uh, they can help us to manage our health crisis, like the current one, uh, and predict the next one before any human being can. But they can also do harm. And that is why high-risk applications need to be properly regulated. And that's what people worry about. So we have a lot of work we can do together in order to reassure people about the progress that can be made in the digital technology area the application of the digital transformation can happen and for people to embrace it rather than worry too much about it with all of the safeguards that we can put together. Great, thank you. Um, Senator, go back to, to you now. Hopefully uh, you're I, able to... Uh, I think I'm okay, I don't, <laughs> hopefully. Okay, well, you, I, let, I you let us Ron know. I me out there. <laughs> 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 so I'm going to talk to another. E I'm going to go to another easy question. Um, no conversation about the changing global order would be complete without discussing the growing influence and ambitions of China, especially considering recent actions taken by the People's Republic. As we think about the next generation of our digitized world, with 5G speed, quantum computing, and AI learning, has the West reached an inflection point? in its relationship with China. And the others, uh, Brad or Commissioner, you're certainly welcome to jump in on uh, that one as well. Senator? I would say that we have reached an inflection point uh, with our relationship with China, but in many ways it was inevitable because this is really a battle for the future of who's gonna define, you know, what are the standards, what are the rules when it comes to technology, and you have, I think, a basic conflict between um, an authoritarian model, um, how is surveillance used, how are, is technology like facial recognition used, uh, what are the standards for how we treat people's data and information, versus more of a free societies model, as, uh, as Dan mentioned uh, at the beginning when he introduced this panel. And that's the one, you know, where obviously our relationship with the EU and our relationship with the United Kingdom, it's really important uh, that we are in a position where we're defining what the standards are and what the rules are going to be uh, when we're thinking about people's data, when we're thinking about how we use new technology um, like AI, uh, like facial recognition, 
perhaps even technology we haven't anticipated yet. And as you see this conflict between the United States and China, it's also defined in our defense strategy and the great power competition that we have uh, with China. But it's important, I think, for us to really strengthen our alliances on this issue because this is not just a U.S.-China uh, uh, issue when it comes to who's going to define the standards. And we know that, obviously, China has engaged in you know, stealing trade secrets, intellectual property, uh, standards that we would not condone, nor if you want to uh, be part of a trade system that works effectively, that are fair and, and playing by the rules. So, um, you know, the Trump administration has used a blunt instrument, but has raised the issue rightly. And I hope that we can come together more with our allies to really address this uh, not only on the national security context, the technology, the economic issues, because this issue is going to continue with us, and it is one that is going to define this coming century, I think. Brad, Brad I'm going to go to you now. Um, I think about how different life would have been, both personally and professionally, if the pandemic had hit 15 years ago, uh, 20 years ago. Um, that said, not everyone can work in a virtual environment now, right? Um, how concerned are you about the rapid digitization of our economy and how it might negatively impact large portions of the society? And if you can talk a little bit about how Microsoft is working to help bridge that uh, digital divide. Well, I think this should all cause us to, uh, perhaps to reflect on three things. I mean, first, I, I think it's the, the point you started with. Uh, thank goodness if we were going to have this happen once a century, and hopefully it only happens once a century, it came in 2020 rather than, say, 2010 or 2005, because we are able, with digital technology, to do so much more than we could have, say, 15 years ago. Uh, if this had been 2005, we would just be staring at speaker phones all day long, and we wouldn't even see anybody else. So we can do a lot more. Uh, but second, I think what that really shines a spotlight on is the disparity that you mentioned. Namely, some people have access to this digital technology and some do not. In concrete terms, I think that often starts with broadband. Uh, you know, in Western Europe and in the United States, you know, a majority of people have access to broadband, but not everyone, uh, especially in rural communities. Uh, you know, we see a number of countries where it's just not possible to buy a broadband subscription. Uh, we see certain urban areas where certain groups of people can't afford to buy a broadband subscription. And even if they uh, have access to it, they may not have a device that enables them to use it. Uh, and so that really risks exacerbating every other divide that we see. Um, so as you mentioned, we at Microsoft have been working. We've been working in Europe and in the United States and in many other places uh, to try to partner with telecommunications companies, to work with governments, uh, to accelerate new wireless technology that is now available for broadband that brings down the cost uh, of reaching rural communities in particular. And we're trying to couple that with work around skills. Uh, because uh, as you mentioned at the outset, you know, we do anticipate that this is a decade where even the next five years will create almost 150 million new jobs around the world that require more digital skills. So it, we have to close the broadband gap and we have to close the skilling gap. But then I do think there's a final thing that is probably important, especially for, for a group uh, like the IRI and for all of us watching uh, today to remember, this technology is great for keeping us connected. You know, there will be some meetings that we'll do in the future that will likely involve a screen rather than an airplane to get someplace. But I also think we're all basically to some degree living uh, off the relationship capital we built up over the last decade. Uh, yeah, I remember actually sitting with uh, Senator Ayotte in the uh, lobby of a hotel in Tampa, Florida at the Republican National Convention eight years ago. I remember meeting with Commissioner Horgan in Brussels on one of my last trips before COVID-19 arrived. And I, let's face it, it's a very different thing 
to be able to connect with people we already know than it is to forge a relationship through a screen alone. So I think even though I help lead a tech company, I'm very much of the of the perspective that says, let's use digital technology, let's close these divides, but let's keep in mind, ultimately, this is about a tool for people, and people actually do need to get together with other people and not treat the tool as a panacea. I have a question uh, from one of our viewers um, that I think belongs in our discussion about the challenges, and it's about protecting um, personal data. So i uh, open it up to, uh, to all of you to talk about, and you've got you know, three different perspectives on how companies, how the private sector and government um, can work to protect personal data because there is more digitization, there is more uh, personal data um, that is out there, and uh, you know, it's a concern of many about how this personal data will be used. And the senator talked earlier about um, China and, and you know, foes that uh, could get a hold of this data that obviously would be uh, problematic uh, at the extreme sense. Um, but I'm going to open it up to the group to see uh, if you have thoughts on protecting personal information. Well, maybe I take, take that first. Nancy, I think Great. I, 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 I right, think I have to, I'm being called away to do something else, so I, I'll use this as my last answer. It's a pleasure to be with Senator Ayat and to Brad Smith, and uh, we really, I think, uh, can engage more in the future, hopefully with the European Union and the United States who want to deepen this relationship. I, I'm really grateful for the comments of Senator Ayat in terms of advocating for this, because not everybody does, and, uh, you know, and we need to do more together the people that want this to happen, because as she rightly points out, the standards, if we don't create them together, somebody else will. And maybe, Brad, you could uh, do a few more of those pilot schemes that Microsoft have done around the European Union uh, they, in terms of the penetration of broadband to rural communities. I, I had the pleasure of launching one of those for you in my home country of Ireland uh, uh, not so long ago. So these are, these are the type of schemes that helped uh, member states of the European Union, but citizens generally to understand uh, the very important developments in digital and, the, of course, the hugely important uh, uh, policy objectives and the financial incentives to make sure that there's access for, yep, for all, uh, whether they're low-income groups or no-income groups or rural communities. Because this is going to be the essential requirement of the future is going to be the information highway. And on the privacy, of course, as you know, European Union takes a very strong line in this, that the, the, we have the GDPR for the, uh, for the privacy directives in the European Union are probably some, uh, they're strong, they're, they really regard private uh, personal data is very private uh, and uh, you know this is not going to be easy to overcome uh, in terms of having a, a harmonized arrangement as we see from recent court cases uh, in the European Union uh, with safe harbor and other and other cases that have uh, perhaps not turned out as well as we have thought uh, in the outcome of the negotiations between the United States and the European Union but we should continue to try our best to, to uh, you know that Senator Ross or uh, Secretary Ross and I have had a number of conversations about how we can advance this with our colleagues here in Europe and hopefully we can do that in the in the in the in the coming months. Okay, great. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for joining us this morning. Have a good week. Thanks very much. I'll so turn it over I to can build Brad. on what Senator Yad said before and talk a little bit about privacy. Um, you know, I, I first think it's worth just recognizing that the amount of data that is collected on each of us is you know, to some degree uh, almost breathtaking in the year 2020. Uh, and you know, it's often collected for good reason. It helps us with the conveniences of our lives and in many other ways as well. Um, but you know, the data that exists in data sets around the world can be used to infer an awful lot or simply just know, uh, you know more than I think even what most people might imagine. So how do we manage that? Well, I think we first need to recognize that this is an issue that has two parts to it. One is of it uh, involves corporate use of data, companies that have our data, and the other is governments and government use of data. Uh, on the company side, you know, the protection of personal data really is an area that has been led for 30 years now by Europe, uh, first by certain member states, but really by the European Union itself uh, for a quarter of a century. 
And you know, one of the things that we've advocated for is to build more common ground across the Atlantic. Uh, we think that the United States and American consumers would benefit if there was the kind of privacy protection in the U.S. that is enjoyed by people in Europe. In fact, that's why when the GDPR took effect, uh, we w became the first. In fact, we remain the only large tech company uh, to apply the benefits of the GDPR to all of our customers everywhere in the world and not in Europe alone. Uh, but I think if we could establish more common rules across the Atlantic, that would facilitate trust and it would fa facilitate trade and commerce. And now, interestingly, on the government side, there are real issues as well. Uh, we saw those sort of you know, burst into public view uh, with the Snowden disclosures in the year 2013. Even though I would probably argue that the U.S. has more legal protections uh, you know, with respect to government use of data than many European countries. But here, too, I think that the answer is similar. We need more transatlantic collaboration. And specifically, when the United States Congress passed the Cloud Act two years ago, it created a framework for international agreements so that governments could agree on when the government in one country could seek to access the data that sits in another. Uh, if we can get Europe and North America working more closely together, I think we would create the building block for what the world really needs in the decade ahead, and that is the development of more global norms. Um, but I think global norms have to start with shared values among the world's democratic countries and especially across the Atlantic. Senator, did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, or? I, I, I agree with what Brad said. I mean, the reality is right now that the, especially in the U.S., I think the technology is outpacing the standards. And it's time for some bipartisan consensus about what our policy is so that not only um, we see Europe with GDPR, but we know that this is a very important issue that we not only need to cooperate with Europe on, but have some bipartisan consensus on how to deal with these issues in the U.S. And uh, we're behind on that, and it's time for us to really, our lawmakers, I think on both sides of the aisle that are very concerned about these issues, uh, for their constituents on privacy, on how technology is used to come to some agreement, and, and then also build that consensus across the Atlantic. Great. Um, another question um, from one of our uh, viewers. So democracies around the world are already, and, and you all have touched on this a little bit, but I'll, I'll crystallize it. Democracies around the world are already feeling the strain of the pandemic. pandemic. Many governments are, have taken executive powers to control the health crisis, raising concerns about how long-term these expanded powers uh, will continue to curtail democratic uh, rights. What is your assessment of this risk to democracy and governance worldwide, and how will the byproducts of new technologies and digital tools uh, influence the direction these countries may be headed? Well, I'm happy to, to take a first uh, uh, stab at that. I mean, first of all, I do think that the, uh, the risk of expanded executive power and the erosion of human rights in some countries is a real one. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, it's often been seen uh, that a crisis is used both legitimately to take steps that uh, are extraordinary because the needs are extraordinary, uh, but also to put in place measures that may persist after the crisis passes or even just be used as an excuse to do something that a government wanted to do even before the crisis arrived. And I think if we keep that North Star in mind that the ambassador said at the beginning and think about democracy and fundamental human rights, uh, you know, this is a time for us to think about all of that. Uh, we saw this very quickly in March and April and May uh, when we saw some governments move in ways that gave us pause uh, to use digital technology to, say, track people's movements because of the pandemic. Uh, that's why we as a company sat down and we you know, developed seven privacy principles uh, for how we thought governments and tech companies should use data to address COVID-19. 
And what we found when we really sat down and, and thought about it was that while there was a, some tension between extraordinary measures and privacy, a lot of this, I think, is actually not difficult to reconcile if that's what people want to do. For example, yeah, you know, we said that if data is being collected for public health purposes for this pandemic, it should be used for that purpose alone. And if it's being used to address this crisis, then the data should be deleted when the crisis comes to an end. We said that even amid a crisis like this, people should know what data is being collected about them. And people should be given choices so that they can exercise real control. For example, even with some technology-based efforts to, say, engage in contact tracing, uh, there have been tools that have been created that would, say, you know, identify when you come into contact with someone else based on the Bluetooth signal in your phone and someone else's phone. But there's no reason that that data needs to be sent up to the cloud. It can stay on your phone so that you uniquely, exclusively have control of that data unless it turns out that at some point in time you test positive and that data needs to be shared with someone else. We've also, in some instances, said, look, there's some things we won't help governments stand up, some services where we were concerned that this would be used in ways that would erode human rights. So I think fundamentally, it just calls on all of us to be mindful of the risks that are inherent perhaps in government power in any crisis, uh, so that this is used wisely, it's used well, and it isn't used to erode people's rights, either during the crisis unnecessarily or after the crisis passes. Uh, that, that was really well said, and I think transparency is the key to all of this. Because if you have an open society, you can be transparent with people about what you're doing, what they're, they're, you're doing with their data, and also how it's going to be used and how they can protect it. And I think you see authoritarian governments obviously taking advantage of the crisis in some ways, and anything that we can do to prevent them from using the technology in that way to do so, we should. Yeah. Any thoughts uh, before we go to talking about um, how do we harness the potential of technology? I um, want to get uh, your thoughts on how we can strengthen the fight against disinformation. Um, wondered if uh, either of you had any uh, thoughts on that to share. Well, I, I, I would say first we have to start with a thorough understanding of the problem because you can't fight a problem you don't understand. Uh, and, you know, it's worth recalling that it was really just four years ago that this problem burst into our consciousness, um, you know, with the U.S. presidential election and with the Brexit vote, and then the next year with the French presidential election. Uh, and we have seen this problem move around the world to virtually, uh, you know, all of the world's democracies, and especially, say, the democracies uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, we've seen governments become more sophisticated in their disinformation campaigns, and I think we have to assume that that trend will continue. Uh, we saw this start, frankly, with attacks uh, by groups associated with Russia in 2016, uh, and we increasingly are seeing this spread. Uh, as especially in 2020, we see not only continued attacks from Russia, uh, but activity based in Iran and China as well. So then that obviously leads to the question, what do we do about it? Uh, I think this almost uniquely calls for, it really requires close collaboration between the tech sector and governments and civil society. Uh, you know, unlike the traditional planes of battle, say land, sea, or the air, you know, when you're talking about a battle with technology, you're often talking about infrastructure that is privately owned and operated by, say, tech companies or telecommunications companies. So I think it's really incumbent on us to step up, to share what we're seeing, uh, to take steps our, with our customers, to harden our defenses, but really perhaps most especially to work more closely with the world's uh, democracies. Uh, I do think that we are starting to see more effective measures taken by a number of tech companies. I think that's good news. Uh, I think we're seeing across the Atlantic 
uh, governments work more closely together. Uh, I think it's vital that they con continue to step forward and publicly attribute attacks to specific nation state actors when they see them. Uh, we're starting to see deterrent strategies uh, emerge by the Western governments. That's essential. And I would just say, finally, we need new norms. We need to strengthen our international and multilateral frameworks. Uh, we're seeing that as well, uh, but we need a lot more of that, too. Uh, I would agree we need new norms, but I, and I also think that um, not only openness of calling people out um, and deterrence that Brad talked about, but also accountability. Uh, you know, I think that the idea of letting people know the source upon which some of this information is coming is critical and having some accountability for that. Okay, great. So why don't we go ahead now and turn to um, your ideas on, and Brad talked about this a little bit when, when we were discussing uh, problems with uh, disinformation, but let's talk more broadly now about how best the private sector and government can work to harness uh, the potential of technology. Um, Brad, what recommendation would you give to policymakers interested in facilitating digital innovation and growth in the technology sector? And how can the business community work with regulators to build momentum in the industry? Well, I think it's a great question, and I think it starts with uh, uh, government leaders uh, really asking themselves, then defining for the public uh, their principles and their priorities. Uh, yeah, I would almost go back to where we began. Uh, certainly, the first north star for this conversation, you know, for really the uh, the longstanding work of the IRI and and for the European Union itself, is in no small measure uh, the protection and the promotion of democracy. Uh, and I think uh, that you know, digital technology is something that can make uh, the democratic process more accessible, uh, but it is also uh, creating an asymmetric plane where we're seeing governments, as we've been talking, you know, attack candidates, attack even the IRI itself. You know, we disrupted an attack on the IRI last year. Uh, you know, we are seeing, you know, the potential uh, you know, interference in voting or the, the integrity of voter roles. Uh, so I think that in some ways, one of the first priorities for governments, the democratic governments of the world, is to take the steps needed, spend the money required uh, to protect the integrity of democracy. Uh, and I think we in the tech sector have an obligation to step up and help, uh, to not just share what we are seeing, uh, but to provide technology tools. Uh, that's what we're doing through our Defending Democracy project, where we're now protecting the email accounts, two million email accounts uh, in 30 democratic countries uh, of people who have vital roles or engaged in activity relating to the democratic process. Um, but I also think it's important to reflect on the market economy. Um, you know, we need economic growth in the United States, in Europe, everywhere, that's creating more opportunity for everyone in rural communities as well as in urban centers, uh, you know, for people of all backgrounds and both genders and uh, races and the like. Uh, and I, I think this is a, a decade where we need to do more uh, to ensure that everyone has access to broadband, access to the skills needed to succeed, uh, that we are working collaboratively, because I think we're working in a time when there's a limit on what government can accomplish by itself. Uh, there's a limit on what the private sector can accomplish by itself. Uh, but when we harness the energy of the market and we bring people together across borders and from different sectors, uh, I think that's when we unlock the real potential to achieve a lot more. And I think that's, frankly, what people are looking for us to do. Great. Thank you. Senator, your thoughts on policies uh, that the governments can uh, undertake um, to, uh, to, to see what both technology and, and political spheres can work together to strengthen the U.S.'s, in particular, global competitiveness as we continue to navigate the tech re revolution? I think it starts first with U.S. leadership. 
And, and that means I would say also, I mentioned earlier, um, really an issue that should be bipartisan, and I think it is at heart, of coming together around, um, you know, how are we in the U.S. Uh, going to make sure that we're defining the standards, working with our allies uh, for how technology is used, but then looking internally, as Brad mentioned, making sure that uh, technology is accessible to everyone that our education system is meeting the challenges um, and so that we can draw on the diverse talent pool of this country to continue to innovate and to continue to create those jobs, but also to create the technologies that are gonna make lives better for people. Um, that's the key. And, and I, my hope is, is that, uh, that the next, after we're at the convention right now, um, after the presidential election, that there will be a coming together around this issue in particular, because uh, as a country, we have the opportunity to continue to lead on it uh, much more strongly and to really build that consensus with our partners. And then to look also internally to make sure that we are ready for this century and that we can continue to you know, think about the amazing innovations that have come out of our country. Um, those need to continue. We need to give people the tools and opportunities to participate in that economy. Yes, thank you. Um, so I have another question uh, from our viewer. I see, you see we have about two minutes left. Um, this one's a little bit weedy. Um, there's a global recession and every country is feeling the strain. As countries look to raise revenue, how do you see taxes in the digital space affecting the tech sector? And we've seen this sort of um, patchwork uh, of uh, approaches toward digital tax rather than this sort of collaboration at least to this point, between the U.S. and some of its allies. So can either of you give thoughts on, um, on that, uh, sort of a, being able to collaborate better um, on taxes in the digital space and the impact it could have on innovation uh, and so forth for the technology industry? Does anybody well, want I'm to take that? To take, I'm yeah, happy to I'm take 30, 30 seconds. And <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I would just say, in short, I think that the tech sector would benefit and the world would benefit if there is a more common approach by, say, like-minded governments. Uh, I think the OECD has emerged as the principal forum where some efforts have taken place. Um, you know, that's not necessarily moving forward at breakneck speed right now. Uh, I, you know, I think that you know companies should pay a fair share of taxes. Um, I don't think any company wants to pay. And what it regards as an excessive share of taxes. Uh, but more than anything, we just need to get some common rules so it's clear where taxes are supposed to be paid. So not only, I would say, common rules, that makes sense, uh, especially if you're a, a multilateral company and most, especially in the technology space, a global company. That said, um, I think that we need to be cognizant. You know, I, I come from a Republican perspective, and I think that whatever we tax, uh, we need to make sure that we don't thwart innovation, uh, that we don't hold back our opportunities uh, and our competitiveness. To me, that is critical to whatever tax issues we're going to look at to make sure that we can continue uh, to compete and innovate going forward for the country and for our economy. Well said. Well said, both of you. Well, listen, thank you both so much for spending time with us uh, this morning. This will conclude our session. Um, appreciate uh, your participation. Next, uh, we have IRI's Jan Surachak, who will moderate a dynamic discussion about the future of the U.S.-EU transatlantic relationship. But first, we have a message from IRI Chairman Senator Dan Sullivan. Greetings. It's a pleasure to be joining you virtually uh, as the chairman of the International Republican Institute. And I want to thank uh, the Embassy of the European Union for hosting this next important discussion. You know, the International Republican Institute, or the IRI as we call it, is part of the National Endowment of Democracy that includes other institutions like the National Democratic Institute. Now, these institutions for democracy and civil society and free elections were the initiative of President Ronald Reagan, one of America's greatest presidents. And 
The idea was, as he launched this initiative in a very famous speech in the early 1980s in the, uh, to the Parliament of the United Kingdom, was to say, in the battle that we were having in terms of the Cold War with the Soviet Union, we, as democracies in Europe, in the United States, needed to come together and have our own institutions that can help further the spread of democracy, of civil society, of free societies, of free elections. That was the initiative, and it's flourished. These institutions, IRI, NED, NDI, are more important than ever today as we see new authoritarian models being pushed by Russia and certainly by China with regard to what they are trying to do to influence their neighbors, influence other countries. So this discussion is very important. There's been a strong, decades-long alliance between the United States and our allies in Europe. We need to strengthen that, but we also need to recognize that just like it was during the Cold War with the Soviet Union, democracy is under threat. It's also one of our greatest assets as nations who believe in freedom and liberty. Because I believe every person in the world, in their heart, believes in freedom and liberty and democracy, even those living in Russia, even those living in China. So what we need to do, I believe, as we look at these challenges we're facing, particularly coming out of this global pandemic, is to work together on these issues of civil society, free elections, and the importance that we attach to them as democracies through institutions like the IRI, but the importance is gonna, that, it, that will, it will bring to our relationships and the example that we can set uh, for other countries as we enter into a competition phase with authoritarian governments like China, like Russia. Enjoy the discussion. I'm really glad that you're all joining us today. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Surchok, and as Nancy kindly said earlier, I am the Senior Director for Transatlantic uh, Strategy at the International Republican Institute. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we had hoped to be able to welcome you physically to Charlotte, North Carolina uh, at this time of the year, here in August, late August. Um, unfortunately, that has turned out, for all of the reasons that we're well aware, not to be possible. Um, but we are extremely happy to be able to welcome you virtually. I'm talking to you from a studio in suburban Philadelphia in the battleground state of Pennsylvania. Um, and we have uh, an expert group of panelists coming to you from Dublin, from Brussels, from South Carolina, from Illinois, all of it driven, of course, by the, uh, the challenge of putting people together uh, in this uh, era. Um, Senator Sullivan, uh, in his opening remarks just now, uh, I think laid out an excellent uh, panorama of the issues that we're facing uh, as we move forward into what we all believe and hope will be a post-COVID environment. Um, democracies around the world are being challenged by author authoritarians and authoritarian systems. Um, we can name the names, but I'm sure they'll come up in the panel. Um, and as we think about how we move forward into that world, it is all the more critical that we find ways uh, to do that together uh, between the United States uh, and our partners uh, in the European <laughs> Union and in Europe more broadly. Um, we have lots to cover in the session today. And um, as, as the transatlantic community tries to plot a way forward uh, for the world after COVID, I think it's increasingly clear, and Nadia Shadlow did an excellent job in her new article in Foreign Affairs in the September and October issue, outlining, uh, I think, the increasingly clear fact that many countries in the world, the authoritarian states, Russia, China, others, simply have not ever bought into I our idea, our tr joint transatlantic idea of, of a liberal world order. Um, so we face those challenges uh, as we gather today. Um, and to, to face them, I'm going to turn to each of our panelists. We're going to do a round of questions, one to each person, um, on a set of specific issues that they bring expertise to. Um, and then we will uh, move through another round of questions before going to questions from you all in our audience. 
um, if you're on the custom streaming uh, version of this discussion, all you have to do is hit the Q&A button on your screen. Um, if you're on uh, YouTube, you can just uh, ask questions in the comment section uh, below the screen. So um, we don't have much time. We have just under 50 minutes to go through a number of issues. So I'm going to ask uh, my fellow panelists here for brevity. Um, in their responses, and I will apologize in advance um, if I have to intervene so that we can keep the program moving. First, um, I will turn uh, to Ireland, uh, to Myraid McGuinness, the first Vice President of the European Parliament. Kaihed Miha Volcha. Myraid, we're glad you're here. Um, <laughs> um, I, uh, I'd like to talk with you for just a bit and hear your thoughts as a parliamentarian on the challenges that we face in governance questions driven by COVID. Uh, questions of how parliaments work, questions of how executives work, and the impact that you've seen uh, of the virus and the pandemic on that work. Please, Myra. Okay, well firstly, I think that uh, it's really important that we're having this conversation and I really enjoyed the earlier discussion. I don't think we know the shape of the post-COVID world and I think we need to look there for what's happening in parliaments and to democracy. So I'm co talking to you from my home office in County Meath in Ireland. I should be in Brussels this week because the parliament is reopening, but as you know, COVID is restricting a lot of our travel arrangements. It has impacted on our parliament. So since March, we've been meeting virtually, we've been voting virtually, Virtually. We've been able to have our committee meetings, but it is different. And I think around Europe and around the globe, we know that this pandemic is having an impact, for example, on how parliaments hold governments to account. It's also impacting on how people can protest, uh, it, which is all part of democracy. So I do think it will change uh, and we will have a new order, if you like, when and if this pandemic passes. And I suppose I want to deal with that reality because more and more we know that the way out of this crisis in terms of health is to find a vaccine. But we're not nearly there yet, and therefore we have to live with the situation we are in. And when we talk about democratic alliances, I think it's really key to understand that the answer in terms of finding this uh, vaccine is for democratic alliances to allow scientists globally to come together. So there has been an impact on all our work as parliamentarians. I know that wherever I speak to fellow colleagues in other member states or indeed elsewhere, they know that the uh, virus has restricted the way we work. And we have to be conscious and careful that it doesn't impact on proper functioning of democracies. We've seen elections that had to be rescheduled. So there is a lot of change happening. And lastly, maybe I would say this, that um, in the beginning, I felt there was a strong sense of social cohesion as we saw this pandemic, if you like, the increase in numbers, the, the sadness, the tragedies of so many deaths. We're now entering a phase where we are managing a little better, but I think our societies are tired, they're worried about the future, children are going back to school, and I think we have to understand a way of keeping social cohesion together, because that is being fractured, I think, because of the pandemic lasting as it has and likely to continue for some time. So I think all of us as Democrats, as parliamentarians, know that this pandemic is impacting on democracy, but we have to make sure it doesn't impact it in a really negative way. Thank you, Maria Guramagod. Um, we will come back, I think, to that question of societies being tired um, and what that means as we move forward in the democratic transatlantic community. Congressman Shimkus um, from the Illinois 15th District. Um, since we're in a political uh, era right now, it's, an, I think, an interesting point of trivia that uh, Congressman Shimkus actually originally won his district from now Senator Dick, it, it was Dick Durbin's district um, back in uh, 1996. Uh, Congressman Chimkus has been in the, in the American Congress since 1997. He is a member of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly and the co-chair of the House uh, Baltic Caucus. Uh, Congressman, as we uh, look at specific geographic spots in the transatlantic space now, I, I, I think one of, the, one of the areas that we are all constantly in the last two weeks have been focused on is Belarus. Um, and I would very much like to hear from you, if we could please, some of your thoughts on uh, what has been going on in Belarus and how we as a transatlantic community, the European Union uh, and the United States uh, can address what's been going on there and how we find a way to move forward to act on uh, the dreams of the Belarusian people for freedom and democracy. Congressman. Okay. 
This is mute. Who am I? Who am I? <laughs> my, my, my apologies. I was muted. Um, this is a very exciting time for those of us who have been involved with that region. I've been in that region uh, for 24 year, years now. Um, and I think the sustained uh, amount of people and the rallies are really giving some hope for a new direction. And, and really, my, what my thinking is, how does the West respond? Uh, and this was, these are three short reasons and things that I think the West should do. First of all, in a very Reagan-esque style, we should always remember the jailed dissidents. Obviously, uh, Sergei Tignoski, uh, Victor Babareka, and his son, uh, we know that uh, uh, Valare Sapkala fled to the West. Uh, Reagan did a great job of naming names. So we, all of us in the West, should highlight those who were incarcerated before the election, but obviously many, many more since the election. I think that's the first thing we can do. We need to do it publicly. We need to do it on the floors of our parliament, uh, in, in, in the halls of Congress. Uh, also, the, the, uh, the community of free nations, all of us all need to also work on the sanctions. Uh, I have, uh, and they don't have to be the same. What I've asked the administration to do and the House Foreign Affairs Committee is I have a list of 28 names uh, from the Lukashenko family, but also the uh, chairwoman of the Central Electric Commission, the Minister of Interior, the director of the KGB. It goes down all the way to the commander of the Internal Army Unit number 3214. Uh, the, the community of free nations needs to be united in, in as much as we can, raising this issue and the financial concerns through um, through economic sanctions. And I hope that we can be united. Again, they don't have to be the same. I just think the, the pressure of doing that is important. The last thing is this, this raises the importance of uh, multinational, international organizations. And, and the OSC is, is the perfect organization to be involved in doing a couple things. One is to help educate um, the world as to what's going on. The, the other aspect is advising and hopefully be involved in mediation of, of this crisis. You have some key players that are also part of the OSC, so let's say it is, it is the perfect organization. When I observed the 2006 presidential election in Minsk and in Belarus, it was on the aus under the auspices of the OSC because other observer organizations were not allowed to, to go in. So um, the, the West and the community of free nations, especially those that are involved in the OSCE, uh, need to step up to the plate. We need to push on sanctions, and we need to name the dissidents who are still in jail um, and, and pray for uh, Svetlana Titnaskoyaya as she uh, takes refuge in Lithuania right now. Thank you, Congressman. Um, I think that that specific point about naming individuals is incredibly important, and we've seen it happen on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, the European Parliament, I think, has also has been very effective at doing this. Specific members bringing the cases of of those who have suffered in Belarus uh, before the Parliament. Uh, thank you. Uh, now we're going to turn uh, to, I think, the giant that's in the room all the time. We talked a little bit at this, this morning in the first panel, um, and that is how does uh, the transatlantic community, how do the United States and the European Union uh, deal with China? And to begin that conversation, we're going to turn to Stavros Lambrinidis, who, as you know, is the ambassador of the European Union uh, to the United States. Ambassador Carlos Erzate, we're glad you're here. Um, and if you could maybe take the floor and give us some of your thoughts on how we respond to China. Thank you, Jan. And, and let me just say I'm truly impressed with your uh, language skills. Uh, and uh, uh, thank, you, thank you for the floor. Uh, look, um, China um, uh, is a, a major uh, joint challenge. There's no question about this. Uh, it, um, it has uh, new uh, geostrategic ambitions okay. uh, of political influence and dominance. Um, it, uh, it is uh, a major and often an unfair economic uh, competitor trying to uh, seek uh, economic dominance uh, through, um, uh, through unfair ways. Um, it is certainly a systemic rival uh, to the EU and the U.S. when it comes to human rights, uh, governance, and, uh, and uh, other values. And I have to say that um, in the past few years, it is much more aggressive than it used to be in trying to export those values to others. You remember in the past, China used to basically say to everyone else, look at 
um, it's my country, it's my sovereignty, uh, don't intervene, don't criticize, don't name names. Uh, but um, we see recently that it's much more willing uh, to, uh, uh, to go outside of its own borders and trying to impose its values on others. Uh, at the same time, there are uh, global challenges, uh, whether it is uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, climate change, whether it is dealing with non-proliferation, uh, that China needs to participate constructively with us uh, to address. So, um, in the end of the day, uh, China is uh, too big to wish away. Uh, our economies, uh, the U.S. one, the EU one, are very closely intertwined. Uh, so, uh, we should be able to have a strategy uh, where we use persuasion, we use uh, pressure, uh, and do so effectively uh, to move China to a role uh, in the world uh, that corresponds to its uh, growth in ambition. And that is a role that has to be constructive and not destructive and dangerous as it is uh, today. And frankly, there's uh, no better way to achieve that uh, than the two biggest, most open, most free economies and societies in the world, the EU and the U.S., working together. Now, uh, let me uh, move from that to what I see as uh, five specific things that we can be doing. Uh, and, I, and I see May right there as well, so I don't want to lose the opportunity to just wave at you and, and welcome you. It's great to see you. Uh, we were colleagues for so many years at the European Parliament. Um, now, uh, the first thing has to do with, with, uh, with the economy and, the, uh, and, and making China feel the pressure uh, of, uh, of uh, its ways. Um, the European uh, Union uh, is using all its economic uh, tools right now, uh, whether it is uh, investment screening, uh, whether it is um, uh, trade defense instruments, whether it is ensuring that uh, companies that don't play by the rules, that are being fully subsidized by their governments, by their citizens, cannot compete uh, for um, EU public procurement projects, in order to make China feel the pain. Uh, of uh, trying to have it both ways, uh, being able to unfairly compete and invest in our economies while at the same time shutting its own economy off, uh, both in terms of economic rights and, uh, and in terms of, uh, of human rights. Um, we're also using our security tools here, and I think that uh, if you look at uh, the 5G toolbox that uh, collectively the EU member states agreed to, to mitigate uh, uh, dangers, uh, uh, that are perceived uh, by the uh, misuse of 5G technology, you will see the EU coming together very strongly to ensure a level playing field there as well. Uh, and um, uh, finally, I should say, what I want us to see more working on is reform of the WTO together. Uh, we should not be throwing uh, the baby out with the bathwater. The WTO uh, is absolutely necessary. Uh, it is right now in a crisis. Uh, but it is the world referee. Uh, it has a lot of rules that it already applies uh, that contain and can constrain um, uh, illegal uh, trade behavior, but it needs also to change. And the trilateral discussion we have with Japan, the U.S., and the EU on this, including industrial subsidies, is going to be huge. The second thing relating to geostrategic influence that I want to mention uh, has to do with a connectivity strategy. So we must understand that the Belt and Road Initiative is being used uh, in a way that is both unfair to our companies, uh, U.S. and EU companies uh, bidding around the world, but also uh, to create, in some instances, uh, dread death, uh, dead traps to, uh, to gain access uh, to uh, very valuable mineral resources. Um, and so we have to develop together a connectivity strategy, uh, Americans and Europeans, to ensure that uh, investments uh, are transparent are fair, uh, don't uh, tie a noose around the country's necks, uh, avoid uh, neocolonialist uh, tendencies. And this is something I'm working very hard right now in the U.S. and from Brussels uh, to, uh, to achieve uh, in our discussions here. Um, in the COVID world, another thing we should be thinking about when it comes to your strategy is um, showing solidarity to the rest of the world. Um, China is out there peddling narratives, acting like Mother Teresa and others are doing the same, um, uh, saying that the West is selfish, the West is ineffective, the West is not working to, to support. Uh, that is bollocks. Um, and the European Union is at the forefront of showing that. Uh, we led uh, a conference on May 9th uh, for uh, uh, the pledging for vaccines. We collected over 17 billion euros from around the world to give to 
uh, companies and institutions, organizations around the world uh, to support them in developing treatments and vaccines for COVID-19. But more than that, in our Team Europe um, uh, effort, uh, all our member states together have donated more than 35 billion euros, including from the EU budget, to go to the weakest countries, uh, the weakest industries, the weakest regions, to support their health services and to also uh, support uh, their, uh, their economic recovery. We cannot be uh, appearing to be selfish at the time that the world yeah, is mean? thirsting for leadership. Uh, the third thing I would say uh, has to do with human rights. Uh, in the previous panels, we mentioned a lot the artificial intelligence. And indeed, we are seeing how this is being used today and how standards are being set as we speak in Xinjiang, where face recognition and body recognition and movement recognition are being used in order to repress a whole people uh, because of their uh, religion, uh, because of their uh, beliefs. Uh, that is a way that AI actually could be used in the future. So who's going to stop that? It has to be us. It has to be us through working together to set the standards that make this happen. And of course, when you're talking about Hong Kong, uh, this is another area where we have to work together. Now, um, fourth issue is the values uh, narratives. Uh, I am very concerned about these. Uh, but as Brad Smith said, I also try to put them in perspective, try to understand what the real issue is. Um, when uh, governments such as China's, Russia's, and others uh, are walking around peddling lies uh, and trying to divide our societies and trying to spread uh, a vision to third countries around the world of their primacy uh, through uh, those lies, that is disinformation. And the European Union has this in, in place a whole process. We come up with reports regularly uh, identifying disinformation. We are trying to make publicly known everywhere in the world the instances in which this occurs, because in many ways, in many, many instances, people just simply do not know. Uh, at the same time, there are issues in our own societies and problems that we have to address. There is no question that uh, during globalization, uh, many people in advanced economies did fall behind. Uh, we did not uh, look at that in time. And so as we're moving now to a post-COVID world, to a post-COVID recovery, I think it's hugely important that we place emphasis on, on an equitable growth. Make sure that all people in our societies are taken care of. In Europe, we are focusing now on green growth and green recovery. Uh, we believe that this is going to be the growth of the future, creating millions and millions of new uh, spectacular jobs for our citizens. At the same time, we do know that some people will be left behind. People working in coal mines in Europe, they will lose their jobs. So we're not just letting the market take care of that. We have set up a fund, uh, a solidarity fund, that ensures that all these communities will be supported. And unless we do this, Americans and Europeans, we will be always subject and vulnerable to misinformation and, and disinformation. Um, finally, let me just say, uh, we have agreed uh, to have a dialogue, Americans and Europeans, um, discussing China, discussing our joint interests, uh, discussing strategies. Sometimes we disagree on the strategies. We are much more focused on ensuring that we build the multilateral coalitions necessary to be able to bring China uh, to face its responsibilities. Um, but this dialogue will begin happening. Uh, uh, the high representative of the European Union, our Secretary of State, Jose Borrell, uh, proposed it during a joint meeting of uh, Secretary Pompeo. Uh, with the, the foreign affairs ministers of Europe, and Secretary Pompeo uh, accepted it. So I very much look forward to putting meat to all those bones uh, in an effective uh, way. Uh, we do not want to uh, isolate or uh, eliminate China. Uh, this is not possible, even if it were desirable. Uh, but we cannot stand by uh, and allow our democracies uh, and, uh, and our freedoms and the open economy uh, to be challenged in this way. Uh, I hope that China will understand it is important to take the responsibility that amounts to it as the world power that it wishes to be. Thank you, Ambassador. And thank you also for jumping ahead and answering the second round of questions. I may not, I may not grant quite so much time as we go into the second round, but thank you for that very extensive and, and thought-provoking uh, uh, discussion. Um, now we're going to turn to uh, South Carolina. Congressman Joe Wilson uh, from South Carolina's 2nd District. 
has been in the United States Congress since 2001. Before that, um, a state senator in South Carolina with whom I once drove across Slovakia on a summer July day um, while he was training a number of young folks that we were just getting involved in politics back in those days. Um, he is a member of the Republican Policy Committee um, and the House Foreign Affairs Committee uh, Europe uh, Subcommittee. Joe, you're also, of course, the co-chair of the, uh, the EU caucus in the United States Congress. So I'd appreciate hearing some of your thoughts about how we as allies can work together particularly in this question of how legislators can work together. Well, and, and indeed, this is a good story, and I, I'm uh, very pleased. Uh, this is the week of the Republican National Convention. I couldn't wait to uh, welcome John Shimkus to the Carolinas, uh, but have, things have not worked out. Uh, but as we think of the uh, Republican Convention and, and the ability of people to work together, it, it's substantially bipartisan. Uh, particularly on, on foreign affairs. I was very pleased that the Republican comp, uh, platform, uh, which is actually a repeat of the 2016, and so looking back to 2016, which has been adopted for 2020, it begins with renewing the European alliance. Uh, and, uh, and then the first sentence uh, indicates that it's the bipartisan support for our different alliances that we have with Europe and uh, of course, our shared heritage. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to uh, working together and uh, as we face the issues immediately of uh, the uh, COVID virus, uh, a, a concern I have is that uh, with all countries uh, that uh, initially, uh, possibly there would be an inward looking uh, as to protection of families uh, within uh, a particular country, within a particular state, province, whatever. Uh, but actually it gives us an opportunity, uh, as was cited a few minutes ago, that we can work together uh, and work together internationally. And already President Trump has reached out to the pharmaceutical uh, industry uh, and the uh, infrastructure of Europe. Uh, he additionally uh, has uh, reached out to Israel, Gilead, uh, how important that is. And then uh, I'm, I'm really grateful that he is working very closely with the pharmaceutical infrastructure and capabilities of India. And so we, we have an extraordinary opportunity uh, facing a, a huge challenge of working together. But, and so I'm very optimistic that uh, we'll be able to develop uh, the vaccine. Uh, Vice President Mike Pence has been the leadership uh, uh, for the Operation Warp Speed. Uh, all of this is uh, jointly um, uh, uh, together uh, internationally. Uh, and so uh, I, I'm just so hopeful that uh, indeed, instead of dividing, this can bring us together so that we can face other issues that we have that you were identified, Ambassador, as you did. Sadly, the uh, challenge of uh, China, the stealing of trade secrets. Hey, who would imagine? They were trying to also steal the uh, technology uh, to develop the vaccine. Uh, it just, uh, it seems unending. Uh, and then, sadly, we need to recognize working together uh, with the aggression that we see from the Russian Federation uh, and uh, how horrible it is that we're reminded uh, even today with Alexander Navalny, the uh, totalitarian or authoritarian government that sadly is existent in the Russian Federation. But over and over, uh, and, and we need to be facing, sadly, the uh, missile capabilities that Iran uh, is uh, threatening to uh, to continue their development, uh, which currently can strike southeastern Europe, uh, but really their goal is beyond that. But over and over, uh, I'm just uh, grateful uh, from a bipartisan standpoint, working with Congressman Greg Meeks, uh, who is a Democrat from uh, Queens, uh, to be the co-chair of the EU caucus, and however we can be uh, working together. And I also work very closely with OSCE, uh, the Helsinki Commission, working with Congressman Elsie Hastings of Florida. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I know the coverage uh, by the media is that uh, we're in constant conflict uh, in Congress, but we can work together. Congressman, that's a great message. Um, let's now turn to Ambassador Paula Dobryansky. Uh, Ambassador, um, you too have been spending a considerable amount of time thinking about the China question and how we can respond together. So I will uh, turn it over to you. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Jan. I'm going to make three three brief points. China, in my view, is certainly an area that both the United States and the EU and the transatlantic community at large, if I may say, 
should be working on, and there's a real foundation there. The Trump administration issued in December of 2017 a national security strategy which highlighted the fact that we are in the midst of strategic competition with both Russia and China. And what unites them is, in the first place, an objective of striving to minimize, if not marginalize, U.S. influence internationally. But very significantly and germane to this conversation, there's also an intent to try to fragment our alliance and to split us over issues. And we see that in action. And interestingly enough, as the ambassador did mention, in terms of our own assessment, and as he said, and I know that the EU strategic outlook had categorized China as a systemic rival. So my first point is there's a real base there in terms of the way in which we assess the current threat and the challenge that we have before us. Let me go to my, my second point, and that is with regard to uh, our own societies. Uh, it's very striking to me, and we have two members of Congress with us from the United States. Uh, I know that there are lots of issues within Congress in which there's a battleground between Republicans and Democrats. But I would say that around the issue of China, there is a kind of bipartisan consensus that exists that China has not been transparent, that China has had aggressive behavior internationally, that it pursues a predatory uh, economic and trade uh, relations, and that there's a vital need to counter that. And so in that regard, we have a bipartisan, I would say, consensus. And also in terms of the American public itself at large, they're very concerned. They want us to tackle it. And to me, it's striking when you look at also what's at play in this case, not just in the EU and its categorization of China as a systemic rival, the fact that also there was an EU-China annual summit, and there were, I think, a kind of conclusion that there were irreconcilable differences over Hong Kong, over issues of cybersecurity, over human rights, and there wasn't a communique. But also in terms of the transatlantic community in Europe at large, not just the EU members, there have also been uh, uh, what constitutes a diminishment of the outlook of what China is. Uh, recently, the Carnegie Endowment polled uh, both um, in the UK and France. Uh, citizens were polled and some 60 percent said that they look at the Chinese government negatively. And then also in Germany, it was about 74% looking at it negatively. I think that post-COVID, there has been really a reassessment of the lack of transparency over some vital issues, obviously, that affected all of our countries and the welfare of all of our societies. So let me come to the third and the very last point, and that is, and I'm going to really save most of it for the second round, and that is, what can we do? In this case, the two or the three areas that I would pick out would be, first of all, how we should be pressing for transparency relevant to uh, the origins uh, and an investigation relative to the origins of the uh, pandemic. I think that's necessary for all of us. Secondly, I think that as the ambassador mentioned, I'm certainly in agreement that we need to look at the economic sphere. We should be looking at supply chains. I know that the EU is, for China, the largest trading partner. Having said that, for the United States, we are looking at our supply chains. Does that mean we're cutting off every single trade component with China? No, but we are looking at those that are vital to our national security interests. And finally, militarily, NATO. Um, there are some interesting developments in that domain that I can embellish in our second round. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, we're going to go now to a short video uh, clip presentation by uh, Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, uh, who is chair of the Committee on Homeland Security um, and chair of the Foreign Relations uh, Subcommittee on Europe and Regional Security Cooperation. Good morning. I'm U.S. Senator Ron Johnson from Wisconsin. In his address to Congress, NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg began and ended his speech by saying, it is good to have friends. I wholeheartedly agree. And I would actually strengthen that sentiment by saying having friends is essential. That is more true today than ever. The aggression and threats posed by Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, and others must be responded to. 
and the United States and European Union are stronger when we act together as a force for good throughout the world, pursuing peace, prosperity, and security for all. I hope you have a great day and a very productive panel. Wise words from the Republican Senator from Wisconsin, and it's going to be the basis, that those comments are going to be the basis for my second and very quick round of questions. You know, I had a boss once who was very wise and told me that in any discussion between the United States and Europe, um, there will be, in a list of ten issues, two things we always agree on, two things we never agree on, and six things in the middle that we need to talk about. So I'd like to ask for each of you to just give me one issue um, in that middle six where you believe that progress could be achieved either on the original issue that you mentioned or on another topic, that's fine, um, in a relatively short term to demonstrate progress uh, in the improvement of the relationship between the United States and Europe. My raid first, please. Well, look, first of all, I think we need to talk and we need to listen to each other. But on specific issues, I think it's the one that's before us all today, which is research, uh, finding a vaccine, a global response to the pandemic. I think our concerns in Europe, initially, we as countries retreated almost behind our own borders, and now Europe is more cohesive. And I think that the US and Europe and other partners need to be stronger together to find a solution. I would worry about one um, pl player, if you like, finding a solution for their citizens, not looking at the wider picture because as long as anyone is vulnerable to this virus, we are all vulnerable to it. I do think that this message of being stronger together is a great message, and we say it to each other in Europe all the time, but the truth is working together is difficult. And I think we have to be able to say things to one another as friends that are tough, because if you're a good friend, you can say things that are difficult. And I've had exchanges when I visited the U.S. around this. Maybe the picture we have of, uh, you know, less, if you like, agreement amongst the European Union and the U.S. is not accurate, but it is the sense we have at the moment, and we need to change that. Thank you, Marie. Congressman Shimkus. I think he's muted again. I am. I am so sorry. Um, bad actors are bad actors. Um, and so with respect to Russia, you know, they, they've been involved in Georgia, they've been involved in Ukraine. Um, and I think what would help is if we stayed unified on, on, on common values and are willing to do not just intervention politically, uh, but also economically. Uh, this goes to a European issue like Nord Stream 2, which only emboldens and helps the Russian Federation where it, it it disenfranchises those countries that are at, at risk on their border who they continue to intervene with. Thank you, Congressman. Ambassador? Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll start with, uh, with uh, Congressman uh, Shemkus' uh, last uh, point. Um, I think that an area that we, we have worked very well together, uh, but also not very well together, and it's very good for conversation, is, in fact, sanctions. Um, how can they be most effective? Only if they're applied together. Uh, we've seen those examples. Uh, how can they not be effective if they are being used unilaterally and in some instances without enough discussion and cooperation between us? So I would be quite, um, uh, quite um, uh, uh, forceful in saying that I think that we have to be discussing those things. Uh, Europe is entirely capable of taking care of its energy security. We have made a tremendous amount of work already to diversify it. Um, the imports of U.S. LNG to the EU have uh, skyrocketed over 400 percent in the past uh, year or so. We have invested in terminals. Um, so uh, this is an area where allies have to discuss with each other and not assume that they know better uh, what, uh, you know, for each other what, what, what is there. Another area is defense. Uh, Europe is taking defense much more seriously. Uh, we are working together now uh, more than before to invest more together, produce more together get rid of our inefficiencies and deploy more together around the world to become a security provider. Uh, and that is great for NATO uh, because uh, our own, uh, we don't have different armies in Greece, let's say, one for Greece, one for NATO, or one for any other country, one for NATO, the same army. So if we can become more efficient, uh, invest more together as Europeans, that's great for NATO and it's great for U.S. Uh, security as well. The last thing I would say, and that may be a little uh, uh, less obvious. I hope that we can work more together on uh, on addressing 
issues of biodiversity, of uh, climate change. Um, these are global issues. Uh, there are tremendous opportunities in the air for us if we do it together. We've seen in Europe uh, since 1990, we've reduced carbon emissions by more than 20 percent, and we have increased European GDP by more than 60 percent. Those two are not conflicting goals. And uh, as we come out of this pandemic and we uh, and we try to uh, to invest uh, in a smarter way in our economies, this is something that I would certainly hope to be able to be inspired by U.S. experience on. Uh, and to be able to work on with you. Excellent. Thank you, Ambassador. Congressman Wilson. Well, indeed, uh, to join in with the ambassador on defense, uh, we've made a remarkable progress just in the past couple of weeks. Um, uh, it's, it, it's amazing uh, to have the agreement uh, with Poland, with the United States troops now permanently stationed there, not as a threat to Putin, but as a deterrence to stop uh, any potential aggression. Additionally, uh, placing uh, American troops, I know John is very pleased, or, or NATO troops in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, again, as a deterrence, but it also is worldwide. With the agreement between uh, Israel and uh, United Arab Emirates, the peace treaty, uh, we have a great opportunity for uh, peace and prosperity uh, in the Middle East that benefits the United States and EU, and then it goes further. With the relationship that President Trump has with Prime Minister Narendra Modi of uh, India, the Pacific Command now is called the Indo-Pacific Command. And the consequence of that, uh, which was cited uh, earlier, is that we have greater military cooperation with the extraordinary country of India as never before. And so there are uh, positive uh, relationships that are going to be so beneficial for the United States and the EU. Thank you, Congressman. Ambassador Dobyanski. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to agree with Maria. I actually, in my capacity when I was Under Secretary of State, I dealt with avian influenza and also the first round of SARS. And she's right, we have to really collaborate on this. But I would go to starting with the origins. It's important to know what happened, what is the nature of the virus, how did it happen. That's why the investigation, I think, is important. And the points of research and global collaboration. As we know, viruses do not stop at borders. Mm -hmm. But secondly, like I'd like to continue on what I had said earlier, I do think that the military domain is one of the areas that we can, in fact, collaborate. And I actually, because the senator uh, had in his remarks referred to Jens Stoltenberg, I want to just share. Stoltenberg said the following. This is a great statement. He urged a collective response to China's emergence as a global power. Quote, this is not about, and this is Stoltenberg's quote, this is not about moving NATO into the South China Sea, he stated, but it's about taking into account that China is coming closer to us in the Arctic, in Africa, investing heavily in our infrastructure in Europe, in cyberspace. And at the summit of NATO heads, they all diplomatically declared that China has become a concern. Specifically, they said, we recognize that China's growing influence and international policies present both opportunities opportunities and challenges that we need to address together as an alliance. To me, that does say it all. And I'll end on this note. Ian Brzezinski of the Atlanta Council had a great article in which he focused on this whole issue of, of, of looking at the alliance and NATO and what we could be doing on China. And one of his recommendations was that NATO actually should deepen its engagement with the Pacific partners, countries like Australia, New Zealand, uh, South Korea, Japan, Mongolia. Those are some of the kinds of tangible things that we should undertake. There's definitely a foundation for it. Thank you, Ambassador. We're going to turn now to a couple of questions that have come in from viewers uh, on both of the channels that they're watching. Um, and actually, uh, Paula, Ambassador Dobyanski, I'm going to come back to you first, because the question sort of follows what you just led with. Um, you know, one of the things we have talked a lot about in this discussion about China uh, and the United States and the transatlantic space, but the other issue, of course, on the table is what we see China doing to take advantage of vulnerable democracies around the world, right? Whether it's in Asia or Africa or Latin America, the Western Balkans and the European space. Um, what, uh, what would you say it's possible for the United States and the European Union to do together to strengthen the democracies in those spaces um, of which China is attempting to take advantage for its own strategic purposes? 
I, I think we should be looking at this on several different levels. First, I've already made the statement in regard to the military. Why does that matter? It matters certainly in Asia. The Asian countries are delighted that we have that interest in the South China Seas and the battle that's going on in the region. Secondly is the economic lane. And here, I think that it needs to be exposed that there hasn't been a transparent and what one would consider to be a reform-minded or playing by the rules uh, in terms of trade. There are many countries that have come forward and regions. I'll pick out, let's take the Caribbean in terms of our space. There are many Caribbean countries that have complained about their relationships with China because they feel that they are not getting, how shall I say it, they are getting sucked into a situation that they have trouble getting out of. And so, quite frankly, I think that we can collaborate on what are the rules and, and, and literally enforcement of those rules, which China has undertaken predatory trade behavior and has, uh, as we know, poached on intellectual property rights. And in that case, we should really be calling a spade a spade and undertake punitive actions. And then finally, we can't be complacent on our values, each and every one of us. In, in this uh, forum have spoken to the importance of our values and our unity of purpose. There, I think that the moral narrative matters greatly. And in that regard, we need to be unified. Thank you, Ambassador. If I can go to my read, if I might, to answer, which I think she was volunteering to do anyway, to follow on that well, question. Thank you. <laughs> may I just say that I think one of the things we haven't spoken about is how do we function better together? the European Union and the US. And I think we need strong institutions. And my concern, and I know from the Parliament side, is that, you know, the the if you like the World Trade Organization and there's been discussion about it needs reform, but let's do it and keep it alive. What about the UN? Um, what about the World Health Organization? I think that unless we strengthen global institutions and make a commitment to reform them in a way that allows us work better together, then all the rhetoric will be for nothing. And I think these are big challenges to all of us in politics, whether you're on the, your side or ours that you need strong institutions to get work done. I think to the points of um, China and Russia, truly what they, those as, as powerful players and wanting to be more powerful, they're watching where we are weak. And therefore, we have to be stronger together, which is the rhetoric we're saying, but we need to have the tools to do that. And maybe uh, my hope is that the three scenarios post-COVID, we get to the best one, which is that we will have learned that everything had to be put aside because health was the issue, that we are going to be in a very more difficult economic position, but that, that if we work together, we can refocus, that we won't throw globalization out if you like, because it is under some threat. And that when we look at our supply chains, as we're doing in Europe, we do it in a way which doesn't put ourselves first only, but looks at how we impact on not just the developed world, but also the developing world. And if we are true to our values, because we talk about them, but I think if we're true to them, we have to be honorable and deliver to others who are weaker than us and not just look after those that are strong. And there are big challenges. I mean, if you speak of values, you have to be act uh, with those values uh, front and center. Right, thank you, Maureen. Um, another question from a viewer uh, has to do with countries uh, further to the east even than Belarus. Um, and the, the, other, the, other, the other countries that are part of the Eastern Partnership. Um, so I think maybe, uh, Myreed, if I can stay with you and then perhaps go to Congressman Shimkus. Um, what is it that the EU and the United States can do together to help support democratic development in those countries in the Eastern Partnership? I think the, the most important thing is that we um, meet with and sit that we as a European Parliament, we have programs uh, where we would bring people to the Parliament and travel there so that they know how democracy works and how it functions and to strengthen civil society. Because I think we've seen in Belarus um, where people were not accepting the outcome of that election and rightly so, but clearly are protesting, but they need to do more than that and they need to be empowered to do that. So I think it is about building on civil society. The European Union has good examples of having institutions that function and supporting uh, this effort. And to me, that's front and center. And also recognizing that not everybody understands what democracy is, how it functions, what our values are. And sometimes those who are free and can benefit from a functioning democracy fail to understand that it is not a given that it will remain thus, so that you have to protect 
protect democratic structures. And I mentioned that at the opening of this panel, that the pandemic is putting a strain on the best of parliaments and the best of governments because it literally avoids or stops us rather meeting one another and doing business as normal. And we have to be very conscious of that. And I think we have a duty to those countries who seek to be democratic and who seek to have values that we have in Europe to help them along the way. And I hope we've done that in the past and will continue to do it. All right, thank you for that. All the more reason that the important reprogramming of, I forget the dollar figure exactly, or the euro figure, 59 million euros maybe, um, of assistance to Belarus um, from mm -hmm. previously planned programs into civil society support. Um, Congressman Chipkus? Yeah, Marie's correct. Uh, these parliamentary exchanges and education, of course, what IRI does, the NDI does, and going in there, that's a key. Uh, kind of segueing with the China stuff, you've got to also fight the economic issues. So in, in the China sphere, they're trying to buy and then extort. Um, so in, in the Eastern Bloc, something that's occurring that I think is very promising is a three C's initiative in which you have a multilateral investment organization along with individual countries that are going to hook up uh, transportation routes north and south from the Baltic to the Black Sea, hopefully, uh, not just transmission, but pipelines and roads. Uh, that's, that's a unity of effort, and that will help economic development in that region also. Great. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Congressman Wilson, do you have anything to add on that, perhaps? Well, I, hey, I do. There's, um, uh, I'd like to point out something. As we we're talking about uh, EU-US relationship, uh, what, what a fun fact to point out that the first lady of the United States uh, is a proud daughter of Europe, uh, as she cited last night in her speech, uh, that she grew up uh, in Slovenia. Uh, how exciting uh, for all of us in America to know the deep relationship uh, that we have uh, with uh, our uh, European heritage. Thank you, Congressman. Um, one last question from the audience, and this goes to um, Ambassador, Ambassador Lombardides and Ambassador Dobryansky. It's, it, it's a bit esoteric, but, uh, but extremely important in the overall question. How can technology improve supply chain, chains in emerging democracies to reduce food insecurity and advance global economic growth? I think it bumps up again against the question of China. Well, it, it, if I, if I may say, I'll say more broadly, we're looking a lot uh, and we're working a lot uh, to support uh, Africa, working with the African Union, of course, our immediate neighborhood, um, on, uh, on economic development, uh, human rights, um, everything like that. And of course, they're all intertwined. Uh, and one thing is for sure, if you look at, uh, at digital, um, many economies in Africa have a great uh, chance to leap from individual uh, as opposed to climb steps that we've climbed, uh, you know, for the past few decades. So a big part, I think, uh, of our emphasis is there. Technology can also help, uh, without a doubt, uh, ask an artificial intelligence in uh, more effective uh, and more sustainable agricultural production, because that was uh, part of the question. Um, we will be using it in the European Union as we apply our policy uh, for, uh, for uh, green sustainable growth in the next few years. And this is the kind of support uh, and cooperation we're willing to have anyone around the world using that kind of uh, to, to bring economic growth, to bring food security. Thank you very much. You Ambassador Dobryansky. I'll just make a 30-second comment, and that is, um, it's a great question. Uh, technology matters, and the questioner certainly brought it out in the case of the importance of getting food security and food in areas that are needed. Absolutely, 100%. It totally correlates with sustainability and really targeting that issue and many other issues, and that is an area definitively that the United States and also the transatlantic community can and should collaborate on. Good question. And can I say, as an agricultural economist, that we need to really focus on how climate and food security are linked and the environment. And Europe is hoping with our new climate law to lead on that. So we, we need cooperation with the US because the EU alone will not tackle all of these challenges. Thank you all. That's, I think, an excellent note to end on. Um, I am just going to say, for my part, uh, thank you uh, on behalf of the, the International Republican Institute. 
Um, and uh, Microsoft, the other sponsor, and the uh, Embassy of the European Union in Washington, our other sponsor for this. Um, I am going to hand the floor over now to Ambassador Lambrinidis to do a closing with a simple Efkaristo. Starbos. Parakalo, <laughs> Jan. Um, uh, this has been a fantastic discussion. I'm so I'm so uh, proud to have been uh, part of the team putting it together. And uh, uh, Jan, uh, uh, Nancy, uh, thank you for so expertly guiding this conversation. Uh, and thank you, of course, to our fantastic uh, uh, panelists, uh, uh, no less uh, the Brad Smith uh, and Microsoft. Um, thank you to the International Republican Institute. I've had the chance to work. Uh, closely with you uh, when I was uh, running the human rights foreign policy of the EU for the past several years. Um, I still remember in Egypt uh, working uh, with the government at the time to ensure that uh, the uh, prosecution, uh, frankly, of, uh, of civil society organizations, including the RRI, would stop. And eventually uh, it, it did, and I'm particularly proud of that work. Uh, and. Um, uh, look, I, I hope that you all agree with me that you know we, we covered a lot of ground today, but uh, it, it just showed that, especially in the post-pandemic world, um, there's no strategy uh, that is smarter and better uh, than the U.S. and the EU working together, um, both bilaterally and when we address world challenges. Um, Mayrid mentioned something that is very important, international organizations and multilateralism um, uh, are important to preserve. Uh, in the discussions today, I heard about the OSCE being mentioned uh, as, uh, as a great platform to address challenges in Belarus, for example. I heard about the OECD uh, as uh, the place that uh, rules uh, can be set, uh, world rules, uh, consensual rules on, uh, on uh, digital taxation. Uh, I heard about the WTO, uh, the necessity of ensuring that uh, whatever the reforms uh, that have to happen, uh, they do happen with EU and U.S. close collaboration and uh, that the organization is supported, uh, not abandoned. And in fact, we're working together very closely, Americans and Europeans, uh, to ensure that the best possible candidates in all these international organizations, uh, when their openings, uh, can be supported and elected. Uh, and this is something that I'm also proud of in terms of our cooperation here in Highlighting of the economic, uh, which is uh, highly relevant uh, to the crises uh, we are currently um, uh, going through. Uh, given the original plan to hold the uh, convention in North Carolina, uh, we have uh, chosen to showcase a European company, uh, Griffolds, uh, that is uh, contributing to the local economy uh, while working. Uh, in a cutting edge area with the potential to benefit us all. Uh, so um, as we move to this, uh, thanks to all again uh, who uh, tuned in uh, in this event. Uh, and um, I hope to see everyone soon up close. Bye bye. My name is Ryan Combs, and I'm the executive director of the Research Triangle Regional Partnership. The EU is North Carolina's number one trade partner, and last year alone we exported in excess of 12 billion in goods and services from Europe. North Carolina has also received close to $80 billion of investment from EU-based companies. Along with these investments come high-quality jobs, and over 130,000 North Carolinians are now employed by European companies. But these companies are not just investing in infrastructure and talent. They're also committing themselves to bettering our communities, investing in education, and building incredible partnerships with our universities. During the COVID crisis, our local EU-based companies have been at the forefront of the fight. A perfect example is Griffles Therapeutics in Clayton, North Carolina, who is currently developing COVID therapies using convalescent plasma to combat the current global pandemic. Griffles is just one example of how the U.S. and the E.U. are stronger together. Thank you, Ryan. I'm Gavin Lindberg, Senior Director of Corporate Affairs for Griffles. It's great to be with you today. Uh, founded in 1909, Griffles is a global healthcare company based in Barcelona, Spain. Two of our three plasma therapeutics manufacturing campuses are in the U.S., one in Los Angeles and the other in Clayton, North Carolina. Clayton in particular 
is critical to our position as a leading manufacturer of plasma medicines. Our manufacturing campus there is the largest of its kind anywhere in the world. With over 1,600 employees currently on site, we recently announced an investment of $350 million to expand the facility and bring an additional 300 well-paying jobs to the area. And with this investment, uh, our total investment in North Carolina will reach $1 billion over the last nine years. Now, Clayton is also home to Griffel's COVID-19 therapeutics manufacturing operations. This is where we are producing a highly potent uh, antibody-rich therapy specific to COVID-19 that's derived from the plasma of COVID-19 survivors. This important work is being done in partnership with the U.S. government. And we're also proud to be partnering with one of your panelists today, Microsoft, in raising awareness about the importance of COVID-19 survivors donating their plasma through the Fight is In Us campaign. Now, with its business-friendly climate, highly skilled workforce, and world-class colleges and universities, North Carolina has created an environment that truly allows bioscience companies like Griffles to grow and thrive. And it's just one great example, I think, of how we're stronger together.